During the presentation, Lorenzo, you, you mentioned one, one particularly interesting and, um, and important concept, the one of, of, um, of public purpose. And um, in, in this context, it, it's really interesting to, to look exactly at, uh, at what it means and, what, and how uh, governments use it uh, and often raise it as, a, as an excuse for land, for land expropriation. And then how, um, how uh, concretely, uh, in your opinion, we can restore some meaning uh, on that concept? Do you have some examples of, of uh, national legal frameworks uh, in which the, the concept of public purpose is really particularly well uh, defined or, or narrowed in this definition in order to make, uh, to make sure that there are some, uh, some mechanisms uh, to, to make sure that this is uh, exactly used for, uh, for public interest? Uh, well, thank you, Mathieu, for that question. I think it's uh, you are identifying one of the key issues, uh, really, in terms of um, legal frameworks um, uh, and their interface with uh, this, the, this type of, the type of investments we're discussing uh, here. I, mean, I, I would say that there's, uh, the, the, typically there's been a problem both in law and in practice. In law, um, uh, many public purpose requirements are quite often left undefined, uh, vague and specific. Um, there's also, uh, in some cases, there are restrictions on the ability of uh, uh, people to ask courts to review uh, public purpose uh, aspects. Um, and then in practice, we've seen also widespread uh, use of uh, public purpose and, public and, and expropriation for a public purpose in the context of large-scale land deals for uh, agribusiness investments. And, uh, and uh, I, uh, the voluntary guidelines provide important pointers in that respect. They call for much more specific um, public purpose requirements. They also call for uh, opportunities for the judicial review uh, of, of these requirements. Um, and in practice, I think uh, there is quite a bit of work still to be done in terms of solving this issue. I think there is a problem in terms of uh, needing to preserve a degree of flexibility for public authorities to act in a variety of different ways that is difficult to foresee in general terms. Uh, so there is a need for flexibility and that is recognized at the same time uh, too much flexibility leaves uh, people with no, no real hooks um, in terms of uh, uh, scrutinizing the action of, uh, of, uh, of public officials. Uh, in, uh, in the context of uh, international investment treaties and the way they come in, there was one case that actually was an international human rights case uh, concerning um, uh, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights where essentially a government was resisting a land restitution claim from an indigenous people on the ground that the land was now owned by a foreign investor and the foreign investor was protected under an investment treaty. So the government was saying we cannot uh, expropriate, we cannot return the land to the indigenous people because there is this investment treaty. Uh, the way the court, the, the Inter-American court dealt with that issue was to say that uh, the investment treaty actually does allow the government to take action for a public purpose and the, and the court said that uh, uh, fulfilling human rights uh, is uh, part of or uh, can be uh, is part of uh, of implementing it, uh, pursuing that uh, public purpose. So there's also, I suppose, a positive way, a positive light, um, positive uh, angle on on the whole public purpose issue is to see how that can be used also in in ways that advance the plight of uh, people uh, claiming lands uh, or claiming land rights in the context of investment processes. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the interesting presentation. Um, my, my question is, with yeah, a, a process, I think we have been discussing this topic already for, for quite a long time now. So my question, there are two questions. What, where do you see already some changes in, in, in the way these treaties are, are, are uh, formulated, are, are, are processes around that, uh, on, on, in which countries are are convinced that they should be more careful on this and secondly um what would be your advice where should which international institute 
could play a role where advice can be sought uh, if new treaties are being negotiated in order, uh, well, uh, your points of the very sometimes vague or open language, etc. I mean, how to make that maybe FGD proof or, or, or whatever. I mean, where, where is that exper expertise? Where could uh, governments uh, 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 get uh, assistance in this? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Fritz, for those two questions. Uh, so on, on the first one, uh, I think uh, the past, even the past five or six years uh, have witnessed some significant shifts in policy concerning investment treaties. One, um, there's a number of countries that uh, have started rethinking their policies after they were hit by an arbitration claim. So mm -hmm. perhaps they may be aware of the discussion. As you say, there's been discussion for a certain amount of time. But the fact is that in some, in some cases, at least, the, the key trigger factor was the moment in which an arbitration claim came in, particular arbitration claims that were hitting um, or challenging, rather, um, uh, particularly politically sensitive policies that have been that have been adopted. Uh, so there's a number of countries that have very much um, uh, reconsidered their approach. Examples would include uh, South Africa. Uh, an arbitration against South Africa was challenging measures taken in in order to deal with the legacy of apartheid. So essentially, positive discrimination measures favoring uh, historically disadvantaged groups. Um, Form the object of an arbitration later settled, but that really kick-started the process of debate and thinking in South Africa, a formal review of their investment treaty stock, the decision then to terminate a number of treaties, the decision to think a different model uh, for investment protection. Uh, but uh, other countries have also uh, uh, taken uh, taken somewhat different steps in, in Indonesia. Uh, again, after some high-profile arbitration cases, there was a review that was conducted. Uh, Indonesia is in the middle of rethinking its its policy there. Uh, India uh, just recently released a, a new model uh, investment treaty that uh, perhaps not quite as ambitious as earlier drafts uh, signaled, uh, ne nevertheless, uh, significant departures from uh, traditional approaches. Uh, Brazil uh, recently, uh, last year, signed a few treaties that look quite different from uh, traditional uh, investment treaties, including in relation to the fact that they do not provide for investor state arbitration. Um, so there's a, there's a number of, of countries that have been uh, rethinking this. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I said uh, at the beginning of the webinar, my primary focus here is in, on low and middle income countries. There have been quite high profile debates in, in, in the so-called global north as well, uh, particularly around uh, negotiations between the European Union and uh, the US, uh, the European Union and Canada. We quite uh, quite uh, significant reforms having been proposed by the European Commission in that space. So I would say there is, there's been quite a quite a bit happening uh, and 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 I think there is uh, in that context also quite a bit that can be built upon in terms of further advancing this this thinking now I think where perhaps there hasn't been uh, quite the same uh, uh, level of thinking or progress has been in in the sort of area that I highlighted that uh, uh, really lie at the interface between uh, investment treaties and land rights. Uh, there's been some thinking around integrating labor standards, environmental issues into investment treaties, but there hasn't been progress at all, as far as I'm aware, of thinking through um, uh, addressing the land governance dimensions in that, and in particular uh, creating possible synergies between between the international instruments that have been emerging on the land governance front, the uh, VGGT being a key one, uh, and, and investment treaties. In that respect, there hasn't been any, any actual progress. So I think there's still quite a bit of work that could be done to assess what would be useful, assess what would actually make a difference uh, uh, in, in practice, and also how, how to affect that into, into actual changes in, in um, in, in policy. Now, in terms of where advice can come from, um, I think there are there are a number of sites of expertise um, 
particular international investment treaties uh, within the UN system. There's UNCTAD. Uh, they have been uh, a key a key site uh, for discussions on uh, international investment treaties for uh, for a good while, and they and they have expertise in that area. There are also a number of uh, actors outside of the UN system. Um, our, our colleagues at IISD have been active on that for a while. Uh, there's a number. There's a number of others uh, involving, including action um, in support of government negotiators. Um, uh, but I think the sort of issues I'm, I'm, I'm raising here also call for trying to bridge different areas of expertise, um, uh, particularly when in relation to land, how how to bridge that gap between different communities of practice, people who understand what these investments actually mean on the ground. Uh, and I've been focusing here on agribusiness, but in fact, investments in extractive industries, they can also have significant land dimensions, as, as we know, and what this would translate into in the context of investment treaties. So looking also at sites of expertise in, in the area of land and the interface of land and investment. I think there's a, a space there for catalyzing bringing together these different, these different sources of, of expertise and also channeling, making the links between where the expertise lies and where demand for expertise is. And, that, and I think that's still to be properly thought through. Hello, it's Mauro. Uh, can I make uh, one comment and two questions, and pose two questions, please? Yes, go ahead, Mauro. Thank you very much. It's uh, Mauro Girotti from the Italian agency for development cooperation. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, uh, congratulations for organizing this webinar uh, and also for the very clear, interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I have a comment and practically two questions. The comment uh, is, is a broad one uh, and refer also to our uh, major interest as a, a platform, global platform uh, on the Agenda 2030. I think it will be very important to start to talk uh, about land, not as uh, an ascetic, but start to define and classify, cluster more land with different type of quality, uh, productive potentiality, but also environmental challenges. We know that between 30 and 40 percent of uh, uh, productive land is under stress, already degraded, and so on. And there is uh, the, obviously the dialectics, the growing dialectics between uh, uh, peri-urban area and remote area. So I think it will be very also interesting to see where are the hot spots, uh, uh, considering that land is not uh, uh, an abstract concept, but is uh, it's. Uh, um, productive and economic and social potential differs very much from area to area and uh, is under different levels of stress. Uh, I think environmental stress, I think this will be also a way, as I say, to trying to uh, uh, introduce more and more in the concept in the broader picture of uh, the Agenda 2030 and the rural transformation. Uh, the question are, uh, uh, um, as I say, are two. The first one, I think that uh, um, uh, there is a, a, a growing concern of uh, uh, trying to put Ray, responsible uh, uh, investment in agriculture, more and more uh, uh, into the voluntary guideline, VGGDT. And this one was also part of the rhetoric for uh, the approval, uh, the controversial, the, 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 the lengthy approval of the RAID, that practically should be a way, both should be, uh, both instruments should be a way of reduction, of reducing the, the, the risk in investment. So the question is very clear. The rhetoric is that obviously the two should go hand in hand, more in hand in hand, but we don't see much. Uh, how do you uh, see practically that we have uh, ways to make a, a proper integration of the ray into VGGT and the other way around? This is the first question. The second question, uh, your uh, before the last uh, uh, slides is uh, is extremely uh, useful, and uh, we see that there is 
a, grow, a, a distance between the community and the legal systems. And also, uh, when you spoke about policy coherence, uh, we witness uh, um, a gap between uh, political will and the technical uh, activity. And I'm glad you spoke about the EU-USA free trade agreement. It's a, a growing concern, especially for Mediterranean country and not only Mediterranean country, about the implication. Now, how to uh, overcome practically this gap between the political real approach, not the, the, the rhetoric, and the, the will to support the process through technical instruments. Thank you very much. I think in terms of the relationship between RAI and VGGTs, and uh, I think uh, there are multiple uh, levels there. There is the level of the content, the substantive content of those principles, and there is the level of uh, processes, uh, for institutionalizing, implementing those principles. And I think uh, with regards to the former, with regards to the content, I, the entries of the two instruments are quite different, of course. One is centered around governance of land and natural resources. The other one is centered on the notion of investment. But with regards to land and investment, uh, there is convergence that is, I think, facilitated by the fact that the right principles, in fact, explicitly refer to and uh, make and uh, make the link uh, with uh, the VGGTs. So I wonder whether the uh, the issue, the challenge, uh, is is primarily one around institutional systems and uh, and 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 processes for taking forward those uh, those documents. Uh, the two documents do have a different history, and that might also affect the life of the instruments themselves after their formal uh, establishment. Now, with regards to investment treaties in particular, the sort of issues that, that, that those instruments would raise are actually converging in the sense that both instruments, although in different ways, are uh, aiming to tighten up the standards, to uh, raise the bar effectively of um, business conduct in the context of agriculture and, and more generally land and natural resources. And, and that raising of the bar is what can potentially result in, in you know, affect uh, financially businesses in the sense that raising the bar on labor standards, on environmental standards, on compensation and community engagement issues, uh, all those can, can increase costs and, 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 and there is the question of, of, of how those costs are going to be uh, borne and, and that's where international arrangements that aim to uh, protect uh, investment from uh, adverse action uh, can come into play. Uh, so in a sense, although I focus on the VGGTs in my uh, presentation because of the land rights entry, uh, the sort of issues, the sort of concerns I've been referring to actually would may very well uh, be relevant to action to implement the right principles as well. Now on the, uh, the second question is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a complex one because a, 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 a land is um, highly emotive, uh, inherently political, uh, but equally investment treaties involve significant political choices too, and there are also quite often significant economic interests at stake, and clearly these are not issues that only interrogate the technical side. I mean, technical issues are very important, uh, quite often complex, but, uh, but, but important, so there's certainly a place for technical solutions, but, uh, uh, but equally the technical solutions are not going to, keep to, to work unless we're also mindful of and recognize and acknowledge and, and also address uh, the politics uh, that, are, that are at stake. Uh, and, and I think um, that's, um, that uh, has implications both for selecting areas of intervention, so identifying spaces where it is possible to do that, either because there is willingness, uh, there is interest on the part of those who call the shots, uh, and because there is space for people who don't call the shots to uh, have their say as well. So there is a, a, a space that is conducive uh, for that sort of intervention. Uh, it also has implications for the type of interventions that are, that are, that are deployed. So not just the uh, interventions that deal with the technical size of technical support, technical assistance, technical capacity building, uh, 
but also uh, efforts to strengthen the checks and balances. And I think this also ties with the question from Fritz earlier about uh, the sites of expertise and the, 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 the source of support. Uh, and I think quite a bit of attention has, has focused on, uh, in relation to investment treaties, has focused on uh, government, uh, government negotiators, because as I mentioned, governments are key players in this. Uh, but in fact, um, uh, there is a key role there also for parliaments to become more involved. In many countries, treaties are uh, ratified without meaningful engagement from parliament. Um, uh, and also for so-called civil society, for the NGOs, for the, uh, for the social movements to be able to articulate uh, views, to scrutinize public action, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, the sort of vigorous debate that, that there has been in Europe in relation to some of the high-profile negotiations I mentioned, I think there is a need for informed a vigorous debate in low and middle income countries too and 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 again that's really an area that hasn't attracted much uh, attention there's a lot of work to be done really to raise awareness to identify and articulate the issues and again here is where linking international investment treaties to uh, an issue that really does matter to these sort of players uh, such as land rights can really help catalyze that debate um, Within within countries and and beyond. So, for, for me, there is there is uh, quite a bit of work there that needs to be done to support uh, support the non-state uh, sector as well as the, the, the as well as governments, and also for, to support the the role of parliaments in 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 the decision making process. Sorry, can I, can I just feedback uh, rapidly on the second issue, please? Yes, go ahead, Mauro. Thank you very much. Um, uh, yes, I, 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 I agree with your, uh, with your reply, but I think also we have to realistically uh, realize two issues. Number one, less and less really international agreement, let's say global agreement are, are made, especially on the issues of food security. Uh, the, the, the door around is practically blocked. And uh, instead, there is a, a growing work on regional and bilateral agreements that we have to recognize this is the, the trend in the last decade, um, posing limits to what we've been discussing so far. And second, uh, most of the discussion uh, is made by line ministry, which we have to admit, not because we want to uh, uh, bring up our, uh, um, uh, uh, say our expertise, but this line ministry very seldom they have a development sensitivity. Um, so I think this poses, I think, a lot of challenges in the application with, of what we've been discussing so far. Thank you. Yes, I, I, I totally agree with both points you made. Uh, certainly, there's an issue around uh, different ministers being responsible for different uh, uh, briefs, and uh, and uh, and uh, and so any technical. Uh, work, uh, any capacity support work that is done in this space needs to be um, anch anchored to those mini ministries that are actually uh, uh, at the negotiating table. Uh, so, uh, and and uh, and as you say, those may very well be very different ministries compared to the um, those who have a, a remit around development and, and environmental uh, issues. Um, uh, but, and uh, on the first point, uh, I also agree that the decentralized nature of uh, international negotiation uh, that has always been the rule in relation to investment, uh, in relation to investment there's always been bilateral or regional treaties, makes it more difficult in the sense that there is no single well-identifiable negotiation round uh, that is, that is um, for everybody to see, it's much more difficult to even keep track of these negotiations. At the same time, it is possible uh, to design interventions that operate within a specific country, working with the government, but also working with parliament, civil society, so that that particular country can make informed choices when it comes to those bilateral and regional negotiations. I think there's also space for international initiatives to promote international lesson sharing, uh, international debate. There's quite a bit of that happening already on the government side, or at least there's some of that happening on the government side um, uh, in terms of bringing negotiators together to share lessons, etc. But there's less of that happening uh, on the parliamentary side, on the civil society side, 
for people to share tactics, for people to share uh, experiences with dealing with these issues. So I think despite the uh, bilateral regional nature of the negotiating process there are still useful interventions that can be developed either in specific countries or both in specific countries and also at the international level in terms of debate and lesson sharing. Thank you very much and uh, thanks especially Lorenzo for this excellent uh, presentation. You mentioned that there are uh, calls uh, for tightening standards and to regu regulate the area of investment treaties uh, more. Um, I would like to know if you can share any attempts, or if there are any attempts to standardize, regulate uh, investment treaties in the multilateral arena. So, for example, um, uh, yeah, multilateral treaty agreement. You mentioned at the beginning that there is not something right now, like uh, in the trade arena, but it's something discussed to have something like this. And um, how can host countries, maybe hold investors uh, which have their headquarters in, in their prospective country, uh, how can they hold them accountable to um, international standards that uh, the, the country is applying with? And uh, last but not least, uh, does the scenario that you uh, described not uh, stress uh, the actual importance of integrating land rights standards such as the VGDT in national law, especially in the uh, low- and middle-income countries uh, so that uh, the investment treaties then have to comply with them if they are included in national law. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Christian, for those three questions and, and, uh, and points. Uh, I'll start uh, from the first one. There were uh, lively debates about a possible multilateral instruments on investment back in the late 1990s. That attempt didn't work. It was hosted by the OECD, but there were then diverse positions within uh, among the countries negotiating and also significant pressure from uh, from NGOs and, and, and activists. There were then some discussions within the WTO itself as to whether it made sense to integrate investment in the WTO agenda, something that at the time low and middle income countries uh, resisted. Uh, and since then, the whole topic of a multilateral instrument has proved highly, highly difficult. Uh, uh, so at the moment, uh, the, the main thrust, the real action really is happening and likely to continue happening in the short term at least uh, in, um, in, uh, in, uh, through regional or bilateral negotiations. It might very well be that there is uh, uh, that multilateral uh, initiatives emerge in relation to specific issues. For example, uh, in 2014, a new convention was adopted to promote uh, rules that um, that increase transparency uh, in arbitration conducted under one particular set of arbitration rules. Um, so that was a multilateral initiative around a specific issue. So it may very well be that we see more of that. There's been talk about that specifically in relation to dispute settlement and, uh, and arbitration. Uh, but at the moment, really, the, the bilateral and regional route is likely to continue um, being being the, the main one. Uh, what I was mentioning there in relation to tightening standards is also is particularly in relation to uh, land deals for agribusiness investments, where there was a sense that uh, uh, for a period in uh, 2007, 2008, 2010, uh, uh, some governments had uh, made land available uh, perhaps too quickly or perhaps with too few strings attached and uh, there were calls for rethinking that and moratoria were introduced in some countries. Um, there were also some regulatory changes in some countries that uh, that uh, went back on some, some of those early um, uh, early steps that have been taken in this recent wave of of, of investments, uh, and and I think it's that sort of effort to tighten standards that can create the tension between what happens in the space of land governance and what happens under investment treaties, because that tightening standards can have obvious repercussions for business. Now, in relation to home country measures, that's a vast and, and complex issue, I believe, and you, uh, you will uh, know much more than I do that FAO has been doing some work in, on that, and uh, a working paper was published uh, that was distilling lessons from some experiences with um, taking uh, home country measures in order to improve business conduct uh, and um, and uh, there's a number of policy levers that would be at stake, uh, particularly um, where uh, agribusiness ventures are 
directly or indirectly supported by uh, public institutions in the form of lending or insurance or, or other. Uh, and so that really opens up the question of how to in, uh, install um, adherence to the voluntary guidelines, the VGGTs, as a as a as a key uh, element of of that uh, governmental activity. Key issue uh, that could that has also come up in discussion specifically in investment treaties whether um, where there should be uh, references to home country measures in in that space. Uh, so uh, what I would say is is a, is a highly relevant issue to to interrogate, and there's some uh, experience that is coming out of specific countries that can be that can be looked at uh, in terms of what sort of measures to enact. Um, or to consider concretely. Uh, with regards to the third question, I, I, I think you're absolutely spot on there in the sense that in my mind, I mean, given the way in which uh, international investment treaties can um, compound shortcomings in national government, governance, um, uh, there, is a, there, there is a real case there for strengthening national governance and for integrating, um, and in particular for strengthening national legal frameworks uh, and uh, and I think the VGGTs uh, they are not they're obviously not a binding instrument they're a voluntary instrument uh, but they 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 can provide the basis for uh, thoroughly reviewing legislation uh, in a given country um, and for identifying key areas where reform is needed to align national legislation with the uh, voluntary guidelines and also to identify areas where the legislation is robust already but the implementation is falling short and so forth, thinking through uh, innovative ways for pushing the boundaries of the law that exists already. And uh, last year we collaborated with uh, FAO on, on a technical guide that explores very much those issues, uh, what the voluntary guidelines mean uh, for lawyers working in government, for working for government, for lawyers working with parliaments and civil society, and also with the private sector, how to translate the guidance provided by the VGGTs into actual uh, actual legislation, into actual law that would be applicable within the given country. Thank you. Hi, my name is Frank from GIZ. Um, I have a short question on, I mean, as I understand, the main thing is to really get the, the balance right between a business enabling environment and protecting national and local rights of different aspects. So, and it's a highly complex system on investment treaties, national legislation, the voluntary guidelines. Do you have some of kind of best practices where you say these are kind of minimum standards, these are things which have to be secured, these are things somehow work together? I think that would be really interesting. Uh, there are certainly um, um, uh, very positive experiences coming out uh, in on specific issues. Uh, so, uh, uh, for example, in the area of, of of land governance, there are certainly uh, um, states that have, uh, have taken action um, through legislative or other reform, um, and they may have done it before the VGGTs. They may have done it without referring to the VGGTs, or perhaps now increasingly we are seeing situations in which the VGGTs are being used as a benchmark in uh, in national uh, law reform processes, and I believe uh, that there is uh, even a case uh, from Sierra Leone where the VGGTs are explicitly referred to in um, in, uh, in 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 national policy. Uh, Ghana equally has uh, adopted a set of guidelines at the national level that are an attempt to give effect domestically to both the VGGTs and also the RAI. Uh, CFS RAI principles. Uh, so we're certainly seeing um, a number of countries that are taking action on the regulatory front. Uh, I think all solutions you know, provide uh, uh, lessons, uh, insights, um, 
uh, on both the strong strengths and weaknesses. Uh, if I take the case of Ghana, for example, there is a, a real value in having used an international process to catalyze discussion at the national level and thinking through what that international instrument means in the specific national context. Equally, though, uh, while a voluntary instrument makes sense at the international level, in a national context, I would have expected to see more of a, a piece of legislation rather than a new set of voluntary guidelines. Uh, so no solution is perfect, but we can certainly see um, good, uh, uh, interesting experiences in, in different contexts. There's also been quite a bit of experience, quite a bit of interesting experience to look at that is not driven by formal uh, government-led lawmaking processes, uh, action taken by groups at the grassroots uh, um, to support um, land users uh, uh, in the context of investments or not. Uh, we've seen uh, innovative um, uh, uh, experiences with litigation of various sorts or seeking the uh, constitutional review of uh, certain legislation. Uh, so there's also been uh, advances that are less about formal regulation and more about innovative use of the um, the institutions and, and, and laws that exist, uh, and, and that really applies. There are contexts in which that has happened in Latin America, in Colombia, for example, lots of cases um, where, um, where uh, uh, NGOs or uh, people claiming land have taken issues to um, the constitutional court or to the judiciary. Um, and uh, and and also um, uh, more empowerment uh, focused efforts that perhaps do not involve formal use of legal processes but involve um, training paralegals, providing various types of legal literacy trainings, linking uh, local voices to national policy processes and there's, there are really interesting experiences, for example, in Senegal, where the government is currently rethinking its land legislation and a number of organizations in country are quite active trying to promote consultation at the grassroots as to what uh, would make more sense uh, from a local perspective um, for that new uh, for that land law reform to look like so there's there's a lot there's a lot of experience there's a lot happening that can really be uh, built upon and moving forward